I had an unemployed villager wandering around here. I brought him up with rail lines, which I'll have to put down when I get some more. Now then. Projectile protection four, that's not bad, but could you give me a mending book, please? Nice, but no. Yeah, not quite. Of all the books you could borrow from the library, that's not it. This could take a while. Hmm, mending for 12. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm going to have to take that. Well, that only took 12 minutes. One emerald per minute, great. Okay. I broke the minecart and he hopped out of his cubicle. That's going to have to be rethought. I will get him back in. Yay, I got him back in. Yay. And he's still a mending villager for 12. I got to go and trade with him and get it sorted before I do anything else. And after all that, I've let him go because look at this. I finally got enough emeralds to trade with him. And he's gone and borrowed a different book from the library. That was mending and now it's Curse of Binding and why? Huh? And I had traded some paper with him to lock the trade in. So, oh, what happened? So I'm going to go get a boat. I'm going to boat him away somewhere and he's going to be part of a villager breeding program. That's what he gets for not taking enough care of his library card. Right, I've got a nice, fresh, newly bred, newly grown up villager ready to go in upstairs. Uh. Let's see if we can have better luck with this one. Oh, this is going to take a while. Oh, 28. 28's too expensive. 30? That's even worse. We're back at mending for 12. I don't care. I'm not going to go for single figures. Huh? This will do. <laughs> now, before we do this, Aww. yes, it's still mending. Yes, it's <clears throat> mending. <clears throat> I have a mending villager. <clears throat> well, that only took 45 minutes. <clears throat> uh <-huh. clears throat> On top of the 12 for the previous one. But I've got it now. Hooray. <clears throat> Look. I think I know what this is. Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Oh, deep slate. That's cobbled deep slate. But oh, um, what if I use the silk touch? Does that change it? Yes. Oh, I can do the roof of the church. I love how new updates now get feathered at the edges of the chunk borders. Oh. That's fantastic. Huh. And it turns out I shouldn't have been using Silk Touch. I should have been using my ordinary pickaxe. <sighs> oh dear. Oh, speaking of oh dear, let's fix you up. There we go. Oh, well, now I've got six stacks of deep slate to break with my pickaxe. And listen to that. What a cool sound. Ah, uh, I love this stuff.
Look how happy my villagers are. Well, those two aren't, but I made them a little meeting space. Look at this, they love it. So I've built all the houses that I want in this village. There's 13 of them, which represents 13 different households. I might put one or two more in, but that'll be later on, not now. But there's just a handful of things that I have to do to finish off. It's just that one of them's quite large. We'll get to that. Oh, and we have a guild hound or guild hunt, depending where you're from. Say hello to Aramis. Okay, so we're going to come round the back of the guild hall. And the first little task I want to do, here's a little potager garden and I want to turn it into a walled garden for the guild hall. Uh, he hasn't finished planting that yet. Oh, someone had beetroot seeds. That's good. I'm quite happy for them to plant whatever they want in here. However, if I do see potatoes, I'll be ripping them up. Potatoes are a new world tuber. Not having them. All right. So I'm just going to put a wall around this. Uh, I want a gateway. Probably there. Oh, need some more stone. Hang on. I do love the deep slate brick wall. Very nice. I tried mixing in some of the deep slate cobble and polished and tile into the wall. I did a little sort of test wall. Looked awful, so I'm just going with the plane. There we are, one walled garden. Now we might put some torches. Okay, so let's have a little spin around the village. We've got our little one-storey houses there for the poorer households. This village is doing quite well for itself because we've got some two-storey houses with nice stone ground floors. We've got a few of those. One, two, three, we've got, what, four? And I tried my hand at houses that are a bit on the diagonal. The roofs are fun. We've got a little cemetery and I will be enclosing this and making a little lich gate. Oh, now we've got five two-storey houses. And I want to show you this one. Come over here. I like this one. This one has a little workspace underneath for our mason. Hello. We've got the workspace here. We have a little living space out the back. I want to put some chests in there. And then if we come up here, little stairs at the side, and another living space, which I'm using. The villagers don't bother coming up here for some reason. I have not really decorated inside any of these. It's basically just beds for the villagers. And if they're lucky, a chest or a crafting table. And that's it. This lovely big house is for our cartographer. Hello. And... Yeah, I've got three of those scattered around. I've got to find them all and shift everything back up to the castle but like I said not much in the way of furnishing but scope for more beds should I need more villages. Now I've also shifted the farmland so that they're sort of just little gardens for the households to work. I've put, if we come around to the front of the compost it's a scarecrow and I have one waterlogged block here but most of my irrigation blocks are under the corners of the buildings so that they can't be seen, but the farmland is still hydrated. So we've got one here. We've got the walled garden up at the guild hall and we've got another one here, which they are slowly planting out. Oh, more beetroots here. Cool. I'm happy with the beetroots. I want some carrots in there as well. What I need to do next is I want to put a wall around this village. Villagers generally didn't have walls around them, but that's a concession I'm making to Minecraft. I want to keep the mobs out and the villagers in. And then we need to work on our field system because I want these guys 
to have enough to eat. I don't think that looks too bad. Before I start dividing up the fields, I want to roughly mark whoops, where a path is going to go. Well, several paths. I'm going to have a path that goes down to the other village and at some point there'll be a crossroads and there'll be a path going up to the castle and another path that heads south down to another village that's all the way down there. And I also, oh, I wish I'd stop doing that, I also want to make a path that goes off that way and down to the river over there. So I'm just going to mark these in and then I'll divide up these fields and I'm going to divide them up with walls and with leaves so that they're like hedgerows and maybe, whoa, okay that's just you, maybe with some ditches or ridges, I don't know. Now I'm just marking this out quite loosely at the moment but in a continuous line and I'll come in and detail it later but for the moment it's just acknowledgement that the path is heading in this direction. Right, the other path I want to mark is one going up to the work camp because the blacksmith from this village has been seconded to the castle which is probably a bit annoying for everyone but unavoidable. I've been researching how much food and therefore how much land was required to feed people adequately in the early to mid medieval period. It's been a fun ride, there are so many factors and variants. Your average peasant labourer required about 4,500 calories a day because they were labouring so intensely and so physically, that's about twice the modern recommended intake. Their diet would have been largely vegetarian with meat reserved for feast days and other special occasions. The gentry was a different story, but frankly, they weren't eating as healthily, so ha ha. Fruits, berries, vegetables, grains, legumes were the staples of the peasant diet, along with beer, ale and wine, which had a lower alcohol content than their modern counterparts. Livestock was kept, but you don't kill your pigs or chickens until they're too old to give you the ongoing benefits, like piglets and eggs, or until they're too old to work in the case of things like oxen. The main types of dish eaten by the peasantry, at least in Britain, were cheese, pottage made of all sorts of vegetables and herbs, and grains such as oats, barley or rye consumed as bread or more usually as porridge. So what did this all mean for land usage? It's estimated that an average household, not a person, a household, required between 5 and 12 acres to sustain themselves, pay their lord rent and pay a tithe to the church with 5 being barely adequate. Tithes were 10% of total production, could be paid in kind and could be the tipping point between a family making it through the year or not. The church as a body collected huge amounts of produce in tithe. In Britain these were stored in tithe barns which were enormous structures that were understandably targeted during the peasants revolt. There are a number of assumptions surrounding that 5 to 12 acres. Firstly, not everyone had land allotted for their household. If that was the case, they had to work for someone who did have assigned land and hope that they were paid enough to live. Then there's the assumption that everyone was well fed. That wasn't always the case. Those going without could be as high as 40% of the population in times of hardship and some people, such as those left vagrant, the elderly, the disabled, were not well provided for at the best of times. There are also assumptions about methods of cultivation. From the 1400s onward, there were big improvements in cultivation methods, which saw improvements in yield and therefore a reduction in the amount of land needed. Yet another assumption is where people lived. Between 1200 and 1540, most people did not live in villages, contrary to popular belief, but rather they were in hamlets or in farmsteads this gave them a lot more freedom for cropping and grazing and also access to large common pastures. Moors and marshes were also useful areas for food production and sustenance and don't show the same evidence of abandonment in times of famine as more usual farmland. As for famines, before the 11th century there seems to have been famines in Europe roughly every 20 years. But by the 13th and 14th century there were famines in Britain every 8 to 12 years. 
The worst of these was the Great Famine of 1315 to 17, which actually lasted until 1322 and encompassed most of Europe, not just Britain. Bad weather, failed harvests, population growth, these were all driving factors for famine events, along with increased prices for grains and other staples in times of scarcity. Ironically, occurrences of Black Death saw marked improvements in the lot of peasants as workers became the much sought after commodity. It's an ill wind. Now, no one person owned the land, but rather it was all on loan or rented. The Lord held the land for the king, the peasants worked the land for the Lord, and they paid rent for the privilege. The open field system was the most popular form of cultivation for those on manorial land. The land was divided into three types, common pasture, including orchards, cropping land, and fallow land. That five to 12 acres comprised all three sections. The part set aside for cultivation, that's cropping and fallowing, was divided into furlongs and then further subdivided into ridges and distributed on a yearly or seasonal basis amongst the peasantry. At least two crops were grown each year in the spring and the autumn. There was winter sowing in some areas and after harvest, land to be left fallow was often sown with enrichment plants such as clover. Manuring was also undertaken by grazing animals on the fallow fields as well as in the pastures, and from the spreading of accumulated household waste, including human excrement, from a dung or rubbish heap. Animals were kept at night in stables, in barns, but most often in yards, with their manure added in the mornings to the dung heap. Waste not, want not, who gets that lovely job? In Minecraft, an acre is approximately 16 chunks, which means if you want to provide each household with a generous 10 acres, that's 160 chunks per household. With 13 households in my village, that's 2,083 chunks. Not blocks, chunks. But not all households had allotted land, so maybe not all of our 13 households have acreage assigned. Maybe I'll reduce it to 12 households or 11. Even so, I'll be making fields for some time. There are end cards on the screen to some more of my videos. I've also put links in the description to a couple of articles you might find interesting if you want to look into this more for yourself. And if you've made it this far, put the secret code phrase, Fallow Fields, in the comments section. See you later. Bye.